Well, it's been a good Sunday of music so far. Let's see if you get a good Sunday of preaching. Let's take our Bibles and open them to the book of John chapter 1. John chapter 1, we're going to be in verses 6 through 9 today. John chapter 1, and look with me here at verse 6. The apostle writes and he says, There was a man named John who was sent from God. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Our Father, as we bow before you today, we come acknowledging in our hearts that there is no other God but you, and that you, Lord, sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus, to us, and that he truly is the greatest of all. And we look to him today praying that when our hearts are tempted to look for solutions among mankind, and when we are tempted to trust in our own selves above you, that, Lord, you would remind us that there's no one greater than you. There's no one more powerful. There's no one wiser. And we pray that you would train us today to look to you in all things. And we ask, Lord, that your will would be done among us, especially, Lord, if there's any lost here today, we pray, Lord, that you would work upon their hearts and bring them to yourselves, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Some years ago, a drug enforcement agency officer went to visit a Wyoming cattle ranch, and he wanted to check there for drugs. So when he drove up, he talked to the rancher, and he told him that he was there to investigate all of his land, all of his barns, everything, to see if there was anything illegal being grown. And the rancher told him, said, you can look anywhere you want to, but whatever you do, don't go behind that green gate into those 20 acres there. Well, of course, when the agent heard that, he looked at the man and he snapped, do you know who I am? He said, I am a drug enforcement officer from the federal government. And he pulled out his badge and he says, this badge says that I can go anywhere I want to, do anything I want to, and stop anybody I want to. So the rancher said, well, okay, go ahead. Well, of course, you know the first place that the officer went, right? He went right to that green gate. And he opened the gate and he went in and the farmer came behind him and shut the gate and the farmer went about his business. Well, about that time, the screams started coming from around the gate area. And the DEA officer was running everywhere trying to get out and he hollered to the rancher to help him. So the rancher ran up on the fence and yelled out at him, Show the bull your badge. <laughs> oh, I tell you, my friends, one of man's greatest mistakes is putting too much faith in himself, too much faith in other men, and not enough faith in Christ. The true extent of our capabilities will always be revealed before God to come up short. We have to remember, friends, that the very best of men are only men at best. It is our Lord Jesus who is the only perfect human to ever live, and it is in him and him alone that we should cast our faith and our trust and our hopes. He's incomparable. There's no one like him. And that is the message that John delivers to us from God's Word today. In something of a fairly abrupt change in Scripture, uh, as we see, John was talking about Jesus being the eternal Logos, the creator of all things, the one who brings mankind life, and in that life was the light of men. And then John says, there was a man. That's a pretty stark change. That's a pretty bold uh, move to make all of the sudden. Of course, the John that the Apostle John is writing about is no ordinary man. The Apostle John is writing about John the Baptist, who was the greatest man to ever live. And that is testified to by God himself when Jesus said of him that among those born to women there is none greater than John the Baptist. 
And yet, as great as John was, Christ is greater. What this means for us is that we ought never to put our faith in that which is less than Christ. We should never trust in anything less than Him or anyone less than Him. He alone is the God-man. And in our day and age of celebrity worship, a day and age where men are going about looking for pharmaceutical hope, a day and age that man digs deeper and deeper into hopelessness because he looks to himself, this is a breath of fresh air to us all. So let's dig deeper in this truth as we look into God's Word and we discover first here today the greatness of John the Baptist, as his greatness was a thing ordained by God long before John was even born. In Luke 1.13, we read that God came to John's father, Zechariah, as you know, as Zechariah was ministering in the temple. And God told him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, and he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. That's a pretty big calling. Even from the womb, John the Baptist was great, and he was great because God ordain these incredible and special things for him. Now, we all love babies, I'm sure, and everyone here, I'm sure, is proud of their babies, and everyone thinks that their babies are the greatest thing to ever come along on the earth, but we have to be honest with Scripture, no baby has ever been as great as John the Baptist. The Bible says, filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. That's greatness indeed. And this was revealed to us in that time you'll remember that John's mom while she was pregnant and Mary came together and even from the womb John the Baptist did what he started jumping with excitement because he was in proximity to Jesus that's greatness before the Lord is found in no other and such greatness is just revealed more and more throughout his life take this in for a minute to get a picture of what's really going on here. For 400 years, since the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, Israel had received no word from God at all. There had been no prophets raised up, no revelations were made, no one was proclaiming the word from God for 400 years. And then John comes to the scene, and he begins preaching. And John is a bona fide prophet of God. He's preaching repentance, and he's preaching for people to make their hearts ready for the Messiah. And it was as if all Israel was just so hungry for that at that time. And they began flocking to him to hear him preach, because for those four centuries, God said nothing at all to his people. John was that prophet that Isaiah prophesied about saying, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. That was John. He was a great man indeed. Ordained of God before his birth to be the closest prophet to the Messiah, the last of the old covenant prophets, the first of the new covenant prophets. And let that soak in for just a minute. Greater than Abraham greater than Moses, greater than Elijah, Isaiah, all the other saints of God, greater than David, Solomon, and all the other kings of the earth is this eccentric, camel-hair-wearing, locust and honey-eating son of Zechariah and Elizabeth named John, called John the Baptist. He called men to repent. 
He called them to make their souls ready to receive the Messiah, and many followed him. He did that to the utmost, faithful to God in all things to the very end. But John's uncompromised, undiluted faithfulness to the Messiah didn't necessarily translate to those that heard his message. Let's discover this secondly here with the problem with John the Baptist. My brothers and sisters, it didn't take long for a real issue to emerge with the ministry of John the Baptist. Many of the people that flocked to him and listened to him and were baptized by him started to form a little John the Baptist cult around him. They started to take their eyes off of the one that he preached about saying, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And they started to put their eyes more on the preacher rather than the prince. On the servant of the Savior rather than the Savior himself. Even in the book of Acts in Ephesus there are people saying that they only knew the baptism of John the Baptist and I know that this will be very hard for you to believe believe me it astounded me when I heard it but some years ago in the early 2000s I was talking with one of our international missionary board missionaries who was laboring in Iraq and he got into a part of that country very remote very rural and there he found a group of people that were not Muslims and they weren't Christians. You want to know who they were? They were disciples of John the Baptist. This was in the year 2000 something, or my memory it can't go there, but somewhere in the last 15 years, uh, the early part of that. All of those years that the gospel had been around and had actually flourished through much of that area, those folks still held to the teaching of John. It's not an uncommon problem among mankind for men to worship other men instead of the maker and savior of all men who is Christ our Lord. There's not a cult around that would ever function if it wasn't for this fatal flaw in humanity. Even in the church, it's not uncommon for the people of God to so exalt preachers or else despise preachers to the point that they decide how they will follow God based on how they like or don't like somebody in the church. I know that might hit hard, but it's the truth of the matter. If you change how you pursue God, depending upon how others uh, react to you, then your worship's not to Christ alone, is it? Because you're being destined by what other men do. Make certain, my brothers and sisters, that we never give to any mortal, any preacher, any family member, any celebrity, that worship and adoration that only God deserves. And we often see in times of trial and tribulations that folks will start to look more to men than they do to Christ. It's inherent to our flesh nature to want to control everything. We want to have a hand upon everything that we're doing and we want to have control on everything that we're about. So when we really find ourselves in the midst of something that we're trying to work through, we may pray to God, but what often happens is we decide that we're going to do it on our own. And we look with hope to what other men can do for us rather than that which Christ alone can do. We all need to come to grips with the truth that when we do this, we're not walking by faith. We're walking by sight, and it's the sight of our own eyes. So let's just state the case plainly. Dear friends, every lost soul that is walking in darkness needs the life and the light of Christ. And to receive that life and light of Christ, they must first get over themselves and get over their own views of personal greatness. 
And for many professing Christians, the same problem is often at hand. A dose of not looking to oneself and not looking to man is the medicine that we need. That's where we all need to get to, and here is how we get there. It comes through, thirdly, a wholehearted, full-fledged acceptance of Christ being the greatest of all. And that, my friends, is why the Spirit of God led the Apostle John to write to us here about John the Baptist. You've got to remember, this message went out to a people that were still disciples of John, even though they knew of Christ. God wants everyone to know that as great and good and godly as John the Baptist was, he was not greater than the Christ he came to proclaim. In fact, you'll find several times over in the Gospels that John, the apostle, is led by God to put John the Baptist in his place. And John the Baptist wouldn't have it any other way. You know, one of my very favorite verses of the Bible, it's odd that a verse that condemns you so much can be your favorite, but it is for me. It's when John the Baptist said of Jesus that he must increase... And I must decrease. You've read it too. But it's a favorite of yours as well. That's so powerful. That's the core and the heart of what this is all about. Making much of Christ and so very little of ourselves. Making much of Jesus and so very little of any other mortal. That's the way we should seek to live our lives. John knew himself to be a moon that reflected the sun. The Baptist never had any, any idea in his heart that he was the sun himself, but others looked to him in that way. This is why it is written of Jesus Christ in verse 7 that John came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The true light who gives light to everyone was coming into the world. If, if it's never been told before, let me say it now. Any preacher, any pastor that is worth his salt, that's all he wants. You all know that I came out of a ministry that I was in for over a decade. Nothing would make my heart gladder if my people can't even remember my name and they can only say, he talked about Jesus. He preached about Jesus. That's all I want to be. That's all we all should want to be. That's who John the Baptist was. Compared to Christ, he was nothing and he knew it. But here... Is something worthy of our attention. John the Baptist is the greatest human being that has ever lived. But in comparison to Christ, he's nothing. He's nothing. It's Christ and Christ alone who is the great I am. It's Christ and Christ alone who created all things with the power of his word. It is Christ and Christ alone that is the life and light of men whose power radiates in his life and truth to the point that the darkness did not overcome it. He is the great physician, able to heal the most incurable wounds to man in heart and soul. He is the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, able to govern us from below through his throne in heaven. It was he that turned Pharaoh's chariots over in the sea while his people walked through on dry ground. It was he that defeated the prophets of Baal. It was he that met with Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in that burning furnace and kept them safe. It was he that met Joshua as the captain of the Lord's army. It was he that wrestled with Jacob until the blessings came. It was he, oh, how it was he, that told Abraham, Put your knife back in your sheath. I'll provide a sacrifice. He is the strong and mighty tower, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of our faith. It was He that ordained from ages past that you would be born, that you should live, that you would be saved in Him by His death and His resurrection. So tell me, dear friends, who 
compares to him. One of the greatest generals that has ever walked this earth, a man named Napoleon Bonaparte, said of Jesus, quote, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus Christ is no mere man. Everything in Christ astonishes me. His spirit overawes me and his will confounds me. Between him and whoever else there is in the world, there is no possible term of comparison. He is truly a being by himself. One can absolutely find nowhere but in him alone the imitation or the example of his life. I search in vain in history to find a similar to Jesus or anything which can approach the gospel. Neither history nor humanity nor the ages nor nature offer me anything with which I am able to compare him or explain him. In him everything is extraordinary. The general got it right. What greatness among man can approach the greatness of the God-man? Who approaches the wisdom of the God-man? Who is merciful and gracious like this God-man. What other God is so great that he could take on the nature of humanity for the purpose of dying for humanity and redeeming us by his death, his burial, and his resurrection? There's none. No one compares to him. Christ is the greatest, always has been, and always will be. And today I ask you, friend, do you hold him in your heart as such? I'm not asking if you believe he's the greatest. I believe all of us here would say we believe he's the greatest. I'm asking if you're actually living in such a way that you're acknowledging the truth through your life that your mind understands about him. Our lives will never be right and they'll never be complete until we do he is the true light and praise God he gives that light to everyone that includes you and friend if you have not received him today I invite you now I beg you now to look to him and to ask yourself who else can save me but him would you do that in your heart as we pray and my brothers and sisters, let us today make sure we're looking to him the same way. Father, as we bow before you, we come before you so grateful and thankful that when we look to Jesus, we need to look to no one else. We exalt you, Lord, for you are God, you are holy, you are awesome, and yet you are like us in every way save sin. You are truly, Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, our deliverer and our love is to you help us Lord when we are tempted to try and navigate this life in mortal flesh that we look to you only who is immortal save now the souls I pray that need your salvation and build we your people I pray in Jesus name amen